Since we're, at a, we're speaking at a university event, I thought we could start with their college data. Um, you received your bachelor's degree in computer science in, uh, from Brandeis. And um, uh, what, what first attracted you to the technology in computing? Right. So, uh, I first got into computers in high school. It really was a long time ago. It felt like computers were invented just for me. Because unlike all of you here, I was not the best student in high school. Um, and when I came upon computers, it was just it was like magic. And I was like, I can get grades for this, and I can get A's for this. It was so much fun. I just, I just loved it. Um, and, and literally, I was junior in high school and I had all the computers. They were TRS-80 computers in the mid-80s. I took the first ever AP exam in computer science. And so there was nothing to study from for the year before. And I realized our teacher hadn't taught a single thing that was on the test. But luckily there was a multiple play section and then a programming section. And I kind of learned everything I need to know about guessing on the multiple choice, and then I faked it on the programming part and managed to ace the test. So that was uh, a way to get into uh, college. Um, in, in university, and this is probably something you're all thinking about, you start to think about, you know, what should I do with my life? What interests me? What, what career should I have? And as I looked around at the world, the thing that fascinated me the most was the human mind. I mean, all of us in this room are magic. And just the how we work, it, it's so nuanced and so beautiful. The fact that if I touch my hand and, you know, my girlfriend touches my hand, it feels completely different. I'm like, that doesn't seem like something that would have to emerge from evolution, but it's, it's brilliant at some level. Right? And, and so all of those things about how we do what we do, that fascinated me. It was the most interesting thing I thought on the planet. And so I did a Bachelor of Arts in Computer Science, pretty rare combination. But I really was looking at all aspects of how we work. So I did linguistics classes, philosophy classes, psychology classes, neurobiology classes, computer science classes, sociology classes. And it was really kind of a, a 360 degree study from all these different uh, angles trying to unlock the mystery uh, that, that we all are. And was that something that you planned on doing um, with some kind of broader goal in mind, taking all these majors, uh, taking all these different classes, or was it um, you know, curiosity? It was, uh, yeah, it was, like I said, I was striving to understand what's what should I do? What's, what's interesting to learn in the world? And for me, this, this was the most interesting thing. There is one story, I don't know if, are any people here in computer science have, have taken computer classes? So, some? So, I, proudly. Proudly, yeah. So I was, um, you know, in high school, I was programming, and won a state championship of programming, and I learned Basic and Pascal and all these old languages. And then I got into C. And at a certain point, I reached a plateau. And I was like, is this all there is? You know, procedural programming and their loops and iterators. And I'm like, it's not, you know, I, I think I kind of know everything there is to computer science. I don't know if you guys know that. Um, and then I met a professor who literally, you know, at a point where I felt I could teach, and I, I kind of knew everything, I walked into his class every day, it was a class on logic programming, and he literally blew my mind every day, and I walked out of there and go, oh my god, who would think of this? This is so beyond my comprehension. He would take the most mundane topics that I thought I knew everything about, so for the computer people, uh, a stack. A stack is just a data structure where you put a piece of paper on top, you push, and you, you pop, you take a piece of paper off. Okay. Like it's the most boring data structure in the world. I know everything there is to know about stack. 
You can't teach me anything about stacks. Because, well, if you start with an empty stack, and you push one, and push two, and push three, and you pop X, pop Y, pop Z, what do you end up with? I'm like, well, obviously, an empty stack and variables are associated with the, the correct order. He goes, well, I've written this little stack definition. What if you start with an empty stack, and you pop X, pop Y, pop Z, and then push the variables up? Like, well, you can't do that. You're going to get an exception. You can't take off a value that doesn't exist yet from an empty stack. But in his definition, in logic programming, you end up with an empty stack and all the variables are about. I was like, that's like seeing the future. And again, he was a teacher who just lit this inspiration in me that showed me magic beyond my dreams. And right at the time where I kind of plateaued, he just booted me, you know, gave me this kick that showed me the wonder of all the things that I didn't know, the magic of computer science. And that, I was, you know, I've been seeking that and pushing that. Uh, ever since. So for me, computer technology is, you know, that, that's, I think, one of the big reasons why I'm in. You, you mentioned since uh, high school and college, you lived your life according to something that you call um, virtually shaped world. And that's probably a term that um, a lot of people in the audience probably have heard before. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what it is and where the idea came from? Yeah, sure, thank you. Um, so first of all, I've got to start out by saying I'm a complete skeptic. I, I, I don't believe anything. And if you give me a self-help book or there's a guru on stage, you know, proselytizing some view on life, I'm not buying it. Right? That said, uh, I'm going to tell you a few things that I've done in my life and a few of the principles that I've lived by that work for me. And in many ways, when I do it, I feel like I'm pulling the wool over my own eye. I'm like fooling myself. But it works for me. So, you know, maybe it's worth doing. So it starts like this. When I was 18, I had my best friend who was working hard and complaining. I can't wait to get out of this hell hole high school. College is going to be great. I'm just grumble, grumble, grumble. And I looked at him and I said, are you happy? And he goes, I, I don't have time to be happy. I've got, I've got this job, I don't like it. School is bothering me. And, you know, I'm in college. And I go, you know, you're 18. You're never going to get back to this moment. And really, what do we have other than a bunch of moments on the surface? This is like the biggest gift that we have, and it really hit me that if he wasn't present and enjoying and appreciating that 18-year-old self of his, he was missing it. Right? So that, that was kind of the first realization, that we have to know how to appreciate where you are right now. And then that led me to thinking, well, what is the meaning of life and all this kind of stuff? And I'm like, well, I know that life is a gift. And, and really, I don't know why we have it, but the biggest sin would be to waste it. Because we're probably not getting another one. And so the goal of life, one major goal of life, is to make the most out of life. And it was a huge realization at 18. But I didn't know how to do that. But I started to at least learn how to appreciate what I had and to, to really not be looking ahead to something in the future. Yeah, that's going to be great too. I've got to make now great and appreciate it. And I, if I do that all along the way, I will look back on my life and I will set up a way in the life. So then, I graduated college. Right? That was a major milestone. Because up to that point, I more or less took what came. You know, I went to the best school that accepted me, and I you know, took a job that was there, and I didn't think about it too much. But all of a sudden, I graduated, and I said, now what do I do? And how do I decide 
And I had different job offers. One of them was in California, which is this beautiful place I dreamed of. I grew up on the East Coast. One of them offered me lots of money, you know, relatives. This was 1980. <laughs> and if I told you how much money it was, it doesn't seem like But to me, one was significantly more money. And the third was to get to work with this famous AI researcher of the time in a really cool startup company out on the side. And it was a big weight on my shoulders. And that was the beginning of this tool that I've used my entire life and it's been so important to me. I say that life is like a book and there are chapters. And when you come to a chapter change, well, graduating university was certainly a chapter change, what I do is I focus on the core emotion that I'm feeling. I let it boil into my chest until it's true for me. And I feel it. And it could be a frustration, it could be a desire, a yearning, a dream. But what is it that's core and important to me right now as I'm about to make this chapter change? And then I take that emotion and I form words out of it that capture each word matters. It might take me a month or more to come up with the words that I understand every word and that it kind of makes a mission statement that captures what I'm feeling. And I need to understand it and, and really believe it. And once I have it, I tell everyone I meet, this is what I'm going to do. And I tell them my mission statement. I have no idea how I'm going to do that. Then. <laughs> Doesn't matter. I tell people, this is what I'm going to do. And by doing that, it does two things for you. One, it commits you to it. If you tell someone, you know, this, and then you tell another person, and you tell a room full of people, this is what I'm going to do, soon you start to go, oh boy, I better get to work on this, or I better, you know, through force of repetition, it commits you to it in a different way than it's going, well, it might be nice someday to just do that. That's not committed. The second thing is people start to help you. They say, oh, I know this person who did da, 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 or I have an idea that... And, and then the universe starts to provide, helping push you towards the thing you're committed to. So I call this verbally stating goals. Since graduation, college, undergraduate, I can tell you my entire life story in terms of chapters. My chapters roughly turn out to be about four years span, some are longer, some are a little shorter. Occasionally I'll have two, more than one goal at a time, but um, a verbally stated goal. And I'll give you just a few uh, to give you a flavor. So when I finish, so how did I choose which job to take? At that time, my grandfather, I visited my grandfather in New York. I had grown up in Boston. And he walked down the street, and he could speak seven different languages. And he was learning a new language in his 90s. And to me, this seemed so worldly, so powerful. He had perspective. He had been places. He knew people. He, he could communicate. And I wanted a little bit of him inside of me. That was what was important. I feel I've never been anywhere, grew up on the East Coast, went to school on the East Coast. And so my first verbally stated goal was foreign perspective. Two words. But it captured what I was looking for. I want to travel, and why I want to do it to kind of get a new perspective, to enhance who I am by kind of looking back at my old life from a different place, maybe from a different language, a different culture. And that's, so I chose a job that might somehow get me to a foreign land so I could work there. It wasn't a high paying job, it wasn't in California, it wasn't far enough at the time. Um, but yeah, so that was my first goal. Uh, a few other examples. So, um, a personal one. Uh, when I was in France, I had lots of girlfriends and had a great time, but I never felt like I was in love. I never felt that. No, this is true. And at one point in my life, I'm like, is love real? Is it a, is it a myth? 
Maybe it's real for some people, but it might not be for me. What would it take to help? So this is an important question, right? And, and I didn't know, so I, so I made a verbally stated goal at one point. Can I fall in love? And by stating that to myself, it's like this is something I, I'm curious. It's not what you think about business entrepreneurship. It was important. And by having that goal, at one point, you know, I had a checklist. It had to be beautiful and, you know, incredibly educated from the best university and whatever. Check, 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 check. And I dated girls and you know, they were great. They were compatible and beautiful. Didn't experience love. And then I met a, a woman who was wrong in every way. You know, <laughs> checklist, not about religion or age or you know, educate whatever it was, on paper, like something about this woman made me, there was something there that I never felt before. And because I had a goal, I took a leap. And when we talk about entrepreneurship, taking a leap is an important thing. And I let myself go and gave my heart in a way. The marriage just was a funny accommodation. So it was a, you know, it's a, it's a yeah. And, and so I'll give you one more, and that might get us into the business side. But I was frustrated at my job. I had a great job, but after a couple of years, man, this was not what I wanted. And I felt two emotions. Two core emotions. One, I was feeling stifled because I had all these ideas and politically I couldn't get them out and I wanted to create. I just wanted to explode and stifled and I wanted to, and, and what I was working on, I felt like it wasn't getting out to people. Like it was a little research project and I go, when this project's over, there'll be a bunch of academic publications. 600 publications for this project, 600. I think, what's going to happen? It's going to, the software rock, and no one will ever use it. It's not going to impact anybody. And so, in 2007, I said my verbally stated goal was five projects that can impact users in 2007. And I was at Christmas party, probably with Vicky, and hey, how's it going? What are you doing? Great, things are fine. I'm going to do five projects in 2007 that can impact you. Okay, <laughs> great. And I would tell everyone. And then I was like, five projects, that's a lot. You know, I'm, I'm only I'm halfway into 2007, I only have three ideas that I get moving. But, and my subsequent, my 2008 goal was one major, one minor. Take the best two ideas that I built prototypes of and make them companies into the world. And, and actually, three companies started out simultaneously Siri, Sentient, and Change.org. But three companies that started um, Change.org has more than a quarter of a billion members today. A series used on more than a billion devices. Sentient to save lives and doing wonderful things 12 years later, uh, just starting the company. So sometimes that commitment, I didn't start out to make lots of money or do that. It's like I was frustrated and, and I wanted to do something that could impact people. And I said, the way I'm going to do is create five projects, build them, show them to people, and then take the best two, the major and the minor, and make them in. So those are three examples of verbally stated goals. But in my life, I'm not going to give you the whole story uh, tonight, probably. Um, but that's my number one tip. And it's not only a tip for entrepreneurship, you know, it seems hokey, and believe me, I, I don't listen to hokey funk, um, but it's worked for me, and it's really helped clarify what is important in my life right now. Because you're going to be a different person a couple years from now than you are today. Make the most of right now, and if you're not happy, you're wasting it. That's a sin. Fix it. Figure out what you need. And then state it uh, into a mission statement and how it goes. Yeah, and this is probably a great segue to um, talk about, hear more about the company that you created, and probably best known for uh, co founding theory. Um, can you tell us sort of when and how you had the initial idea for theory? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So I'm going to actually 
start the story from the end and work backwards. So what's the dream of every entrepreneur is to create an app, to create a little bit of software and uh, have people use it. So we had this little company, this startup, there was myself and two co-founders. Um, uh, definitely go to the there's one other series, um, yeah, that was more like it. Uh, so in 2007, we started a, a little company, and in 2007, so I'm getting my major in finance, um, with, with uh, Tom Gruber on the left and Don Kippas, we founded a company, we grew it to about 20 people, and over this time we launched an app, free app in the App Store called Siri, so like that. Uh, I'm super proud because Steve Wozniak, who's co-founder of Apple, if you ask him today, what's your favorite app of all time? He's not only co-founder of Apple, he's a huge fanboy. Uh, he'll say Siri, but not the Siri that's in the iPhone today. The original app, it did so much more, and that was true as hell. I love this guy. <laughs> a little biased. We, we put in so much love and, uh, into this, the software and design, and we thought about it, we you know, brainstormed it, and it came out perfect, but man, I was so proud of it. So we launched an app, it's in the app store, people are downloading it, the reviews are great, we're all excited, we're watching some of the logs, we're like, it's working! And two weeks later, we get this call, phone rings, and if you ever had, I don't know, maybe you guys are too young, but the iPhone when it used to come out, it would ring, you had to swipe to answer. Sometimes you'd swipe and it wouldn't answer. So the phone ring and it goes, Apple. Like, oh, swipe, 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 come on, answer, answer, answer. And we pick up the phone and we hear, hey, it's Steve. What's you doing? Why don't you go over to my house tomorrow? And we're like, Steve, how did you get this number? <laughs> because people may not know, but one of the meanings of Siri is secret in Swahili, and we were a very secretive company, and we weren't going to tell anyone what we to do beforehand, and our domain name was stealthcompany.com, with a dash, seven dollars on good <laughs> um, and, and so, well, how'd you get this number? We didn't have a website or phone number or anything. I said, yeah, yeah, that's a funny story. Didn't know how to contact you, but we realized everyone who registers an app has to put a phone number field into the iTunes database. So I went and called him. Anyway, so Steve Jobs calls, she uh, you know, offers, makes it clear he wants to buy the company. We say no, thank you, flattered, goodbye. So we'll get probably more into that later. But the idea of like, wow, you just launch an app and two weeks later, you've got Steve Jobs calling you to buy it. That's a dream. Look how easy it is. <laughs> but, he said, start. So, well, it did take us two years from beginning of 2008 to uh, 2010 to create that app. 20 people, a lot of work. So it wasn't like an instant overnight sensation. And, well, actually, that wasn't the start either. Um, before that, I led this project called Kalo. It was the largest AI project in U.S. government history. We had $250 million over five years, 400 people at its peak, uh, the 600 publications that I was referencing. It was a big deal. That was kind of the research phase for, for Siri. So it wasn't just two years of work. It had this five-year period of like, real work on it. And before that, actually, um, in the 90s, it was prototyping Siri that kind of went into this big DARPA project. And in fact, the first version of Siri was in 1993, before I ever saw a web website. So the overnight success that something seemingly comes out of nowhere, gets snapped up by Steve Jobs and instantly famous, it took 18 years from first prototype to first commercial deployment. And I'm still chasing the dream. What I had built, you can see the first prototype in 93 up on the screen. Uh, I had a little tablet PC, not, not completely unlike the iPad. I could use speech recognition, I could use handwriting recognition. Um, and I said, someday, there will be computers around the world 
with content and services that you want to access. And the idea of using hyperlinked multimedia web pages to do that never occurred to me. Or apps or things never occurred to me. I thought you'd have an assistant that you could delegate tasks to. So I want to do this. It would break it down into subtasks, know where the right services and content were, route those to the right services, interact with the user as needed, learn from those interactions, present results. And that's what I did. I created a prototype where you could add new services anywhere in the world, and what the user could say and do would grow, it would expand. And you would always be talking and delegating tasks to the system. That was the original vision. I think of Siri as the internet. And it's still a compelling vision, I think, today. And in one month from now, a little plug, less than one month, um, uh, at Samsung Developer Conference, SDC at Moscone Center in San Francisco, November 7th and 8th, uh, we're going to release a completely new set of tools and platform that will let any developer in the world plug in and build knowledge capsules to a single assistant that should scale to internet scale. That you can talk to the, to the assistant, it will know you, it will do things for you, complex tasks. So I'm still working at it 25 years later. So I guess the lesson is, if you're gonna pick something, pick something you're passionate about and that you really love, because it might take a little longer than you originally thought, and we're still not there. I still feel this is the beginning. Um, but I have a very clear picture of what I want and keep learning a little more and doing a little more together. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought this point about the overnight success that uh, some people might think about with Siri, especially, you know, 25 years longer than uh, most of the people in this room have been alive. Um, and uh, it's something that I hear about quite a lot in uh, students I interact with uh, these days in terms of the difficulty in finding and sticking to a passion, right? So, um, you know, students often feel totally to you know, be torn in so many different directions, never mind, you know, 18, 25 years, like one semester feels like forever, right? You switch what you're passionate about, you know, this semester you're passionate about this thing, fall semester is like something totally different. What would be your advice for picking something that'll last, right? So, it's sort of like, you know, can you feel love, right? It's like, can you feel, can you feel passion that's sort of long last? That's a great question. Like it comes back to my book metaphor. Um, life is a book. You get to be co-author, and there are chapters. You can't predict who you're going to be ten years, five years, you know, twenty years from now. So you don't have to. Don't be weighted with the burden of having to guess right or having to. Predict. So I don't think I went into it saying, "Yep, I'm going to do this no matter what." I'm so it was, at that time, it was important to me. It was, I thought it was interesting and beautiful and important. And that was enough. So I, I, would, I would say, focus on what's important to you and what excites you now. However, um, I believe there's value in life. You want different chapters. You know, if you had one chapter in a book, it would be boring. But, so you want, you have one variety, you will change. But it's useful to have threads, to look back and be able to string a thread through the different chapters to have some cohesion. It starts to give you kind of a narrative of purpose in a certain way. Like this is kind of Siri investigation, even though I've been in different companies and haven't been doing exactly the same thing the whole time. I've had a kind of a, an, an area of inquiry that when you tie a lot of it together, it feels like it makes sense. And there's something satisfying about that. So I would say, you know, I, I can't tell you what you're going to be passionate about. Only you can do that. But really think about what you're passionate about now. And I would say giving in to your, letting yourself be really passionate about something is super important. Now, I've never mastered uh, academia, like any of, like all of you in this room. I actually spoke at the commencement speaker at our university down south last year, and I said, you know, there's no way I could actually get into this school. I could never have gotten into this school today, right? Students are amazing at getting perfect grades, and you kind of have to, to get 
and to the university is fine. I never, I never got all A's. But what I did do was I let myself get passionate about things. And, and I would do, I remember at university, I did a uh, homework assignment number two. I published a paper, had a new result, wrote this system that was so far beyond what the teacher was expecting, he had never seen anything like that. And the rest of was kind of mediocre. But I got really excited about something and just went all in. And so I was chosen an outstanding master's student of the engineering school. I didn't have great grades, but I was memorable. And that memorable was because I got passionate about something. And so everything that I've done that I'm proud of, because I said, you know, I'm not doing it for school or for a job, because I'm this is interesting to me. And I'm gonna follow it and let myself go. And that's been super useful to me. So, so I'm going to change gears a little bit because I want to spend some time, uh, some time on the um, change all work, which is another organization that you talked to uh, co-found, and uh, it's described. So you describe it as a social network for positive social change. So can you tell us a little bit more about it and uh, what motivated you, what certainly motivated you and your uh, the co-founders into starting this? Yeah. So, so an entrepreneur tip that I have is I believe in trends and triggers. What does this mean? So it means when you're going, you're at a point in time, you should actually take the time to make your own beliefs about that. So in the computer world, you know, magically an augmented reality. Is it, is it big or is it a fake? Bitcoin. Is it, is it going to be real or is it just smoke? Why? And, and you should have opinions on that, or things that are important to you. And when you have a belief, try to do the work and the research to just find out, find the evidence of what you believe. So in 2004, it was the 10th anniversary of the web by my accounting, so I sat down and wrote a presentation called 10 Predictions for the Next 10 Years of the Web. And I went and looked at trends of the stuff going on around me, and I picked 10 beliefs, I put 10 stakes in the ground. And some of them were crazy. One of them was that social networking was going to pay off. Now, in 2004, Facebook had started, but it was a tiny little thing at Harvard University. I'd never heard of it. LinkedIn existed, um, and Friendster was the largest social network with like 10 million people, but it still was not mainstream. So the idea that it was going to go big pretty crazy, and it took me a while to believe it, but I, I looked at the research, and I thought about it, and I took a side. And, and actually, my three best predictions out of the ten, all directly tied to companies I started late. So that's trends, have an opinion. And then, there are triggers. There are certain events that come along that if you have this belief structure that that uniquely let you see the future for the next two years. And two years is all you need to say, oh, I know what I, because I believe this, and this has happened, I can now predict what the world will be like two years from now. I'm going to dash them on to start a company and aim for that two-year spot. So an example, I believe that a Siri-like thing would exist. In 2004, I said everyone will have in their pocket uh, an assistant that they can talk to and help them navigate tasks. And here's why. Because the world is going to go to cloud computing, blah, 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 blah. And, and when the iPhone came out, I said, that's it. That's the trigger. What did it mean? Now, no one here remembers this, but when the iPhone came out, most people did not think it would succeed. Everyone's like, oh, hell, only phone companies can make phones. Apple's a music player company. What do they know about phones? I looked at this and said, this is just, this is going to take off. Two years from now, every telco handset manufacturer will be scrambling to beat Apple because they just flipped the game. And I had my belief structure, my friend. So I'm like, oh, in two years, those companies are going to need something to compete with Apple. 
Well, the screen is still tiny, the bandwidth is super slow, it's hard to type. The theory belief trend is just the thing to come back to. So we built Siri to, to forward the competitors of Apple, and of course the irony of Steve saw first and, and applied it. But change.org, I believe social networking would take off in 2004. I put that statement out. A year and a half later, MySpace became the number one website in the U.S. Crazy. And then Facebook was the road. And we, so I, and Ben Rathray, who's pictured up here, who's the real heart and soul and current CEO of Change.org, and always CEO. Um, and we were talking about social network for social activism. Uh, I'll make a plug for another career thread. So I have my called the Siri thread. Um, I had a mentor we should all learn about named Douglas Engelbart. Um, he is the greatest computer person in history and one of the most unknown. Thank you. Um, and Douglas Engelbart invented the mouse. He has a patent, 1962. He did a demo that in two months from now it will be the 50th anniversary of this demonstration. You can look it up on the web by going to the mother of all demos. Type that into any search engine. He, will, he created a demo that shocked the world. Half the audience thought it was a <laughs> What did he show? At a time when punch cards were the way to interact with computers, he showed an interactive computer with an editor, hyperlinks, um, the web, so it was literally multimedia documents linked together. Every web page was versionable, so you could just change it and it would remember. You could work collaboratively, all the Google Docs, and edit the document together in real time. You could fade the face of the person you were working with behind the text, so you could look each other in the eyes while you're editing that document. He did this wirelessly in real time between Menlo Park and San Francisco. It, he's not a marketeer, so it's dry. But you can find the whole demo online, and you'll hear more about it on this 50th anniversary, I'm sure. But read up. So he said, why did they do all this technology? It's because humanity is going to be faced with ever complex global problems global warming or climate change, poverty, human rights, uh, animal rights, disease, crime. He goes, the only way we will survive as a species is if we get better at collectively solving problems. So that's kind of the backdrop of what I had when I came here to change that up. I worked with him and I had this belief structure of how do you empower the whole world to collaboratively solve problems augmented by computing. And, and simultaneously had this belief that social networks were going to be important. So I met Ben Rattray. He was from Washington, D.C. He came to San Francisco as the first tech guy he met. We had these kind of mixed ideas, but somehow we knew that social networking could harness collaboration at massive scale, and we were brainstorming all sorts of ideas. In the beginning, we tried everything. How can you solve global problems? Well, maybe you fund the right politicians. Maybe you fund the right nonprofit groups. We had virtual packs where you could do click to call in 2006. You could donate a square meter of rainforest. Or, so we, we tried everything in the world, but here's a lesson for those trying to be an entrepreneur. Instrument everything you do. And one little teeny feature that we had in the corner of our website, started a petition, started doing well from kind of a data click point of view. So we kind of moved a little bit more to the center, made it a little bigger. I think there's another slide that shows some of the uh, different versions of change.org we tried over the year. But we instrumented everything. And in the end, it just kind of got simpler and simpler and simpler. Uh, step back one. Yeah. Right. And we ended up with start a petition. Well, no, no, no. That's it. One feature. But there's now more than a quarter of a billion members in 160 countries. So if you see something wrong, 
uh, anywhere at a national, global, or local level, you start a petition. You say, I want this person or organization to make this change in this life. And if members agree, they just click. They sign your petition. You get 100,000 people or 50,000 people, whatever, in your area, it shines a spotlight on a problem and a solution that someone thinks that they're at. And there are victories happen every day in every global problem area and lots of little ones too. Um, and so that, that was really kind of a lesson. In terms of follow the data, I'll give you our um, average user uh, growth. Year one, a million users rounded up to the nearest one. Year two, a million users. Year three, a million users. Year four, a million users. Year five, 10 million users. Year six, 25 million. Year seven, uh, 50 million. We were doubling every year. And it was following the data and simplifying. And so now, this uh, slide I have at 200, that's now 250 million members. So I think uh, we'll just probably move to uh, a few questions. Um, and, there's yeah. and there's so much, um, Adam has done so much, which is fantastic, but it's hard to cover it. And I, I'm sure you all have questions. So just for now, I kind of wanted to shift. And I wanted to thank Adam for your insights from love life to living life. So thank you. <laughs> um, if you have questions, if you wouldn't mind raising your hands, and then we'll. And actually, I have a couple that, uh, whilst we're getting started, I can just ask um, for them. Uh, one, which is, I think, quite uh, okay. Hi, I'm a third year computer science student. And um, one of the recurring things I heard in your talk was that you have this uh, sort of sixth sense to predict trends, um, whether it's theory or um, Social networks, or um, you know, the mother of all demos, predicted so many of the things way ahead of its time. Um, and I think one of the bigger challenges that I sort of face on a daily basis is: is this thing that I'm putting my energy into even going to be worth it ten years from now? Um, how do you how do you sort of have this uh, special um, gift for recognizing these things way ahead of time and sort of making making it happen? It's an interesting question. I I'm not some super prognosticator. Um, uh, I, when I did my 10 predictions in 2004, I had three or four, maybe four really good ones, like nailed it, and six not, not so great ones. I actually did a presentation in 2013 where I got off and said, some future tellers only tell you the good ones they got. I'm gonna show you my presentation from 2004 score myself on how I did, and had some lousy ones too, um, and, um, and make five new predictions for 2014 for 2019, five predictions for the next five years. So you can go back and look at that presentation and see how it did. Um, some are good, some not so good. Um, I think the most important part is, like I said, trends and triggers. Have an opinion, um, but that's different than what you asked. You asked, how do I know if what I'm working on is going to be the one? So it's a different question. I never, what I would work on was things that I could get passionate about and interested me. And some of them are like stupid ideas for everyone else. I mean, my, my wife will see me working on some project and I'm packing my head off and she comes out, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. And I'm like, I know, but it makes me happy. So at some level, find things you're passionate about, even if you don't know why, and, and, and let yourself go with that. And have trends and triggers. And if the two happen to line up, um, and you all of a sudden you're working on this thing on the side and you like it, and all of a sudden there's this belief and a trigger that says, you know, this thing could actually be the solution, you get lucky, but I, I don't, you know, do, do what's important to you at the moment. Sometimes it might just be you're interested and curious. And that, that brings good enough. Thank you. Hello, my name is Michael Wu, and uh, I'm a sophomore taking computer science. So I have two questions. First, um, you mentioned that you have a hard time choosing the right girl. So, uh, and then, so how 
then, then how do you choose the right idea? Like, you might be interested in many things. Like, it's like Hugo. How do you choose the right one? How do you know this is the right one? Alright. And the second one, the uh, second uh, question is, um, um, you're working on multiple songs. So how do you manage that? Like, there are people who say, like, you have to focus on one and just put all your energies in it. But you're working on multiple. Like, how, how much time do you see? How, how, like, how do you survive? Yeah. Those are great, great questions. So one is, I wouldn't necessarily use the same techniques I use for companies, projects, with women. <laughs> <laughs> with companies and projects, my, what I've done in the past is do five at once. Build prototypes, <laughs> try them out, show them to people, get feedback, and then choose a major and a minor, too. Not this approach at all in public. In public, if you choose one, stick with it. <laughs> choose the right one. Um, so, so, yeah, you mentioned a lot of people say focus on one thing. And, and I didn't do that. So, when I did my commencement speech last year, I thought, oh man, this is a lot of responsibility. I need to, like, I'm supposed to give advice to these graduates. What can I say? And I hit on one thing that I go, this is the most important lesson. And the most important lesson is find your own way. So when people say, oh, you know, leans to focus on one thing, do one thing, I didn't do that, and yet it was successful. I don't know if this is the way you should do it. So I don't think there is, you have to do what's right for you, what works for you, for who you are, for how you are. And no matter what, I said, you know, at the commencement speech, I said, listen to some of my stories and what's worked for me. But the only one I want you to follow is find your own way, find what works for you. In terms of the how, do you, how did I balance multiple startups, I um, completely structured my life. And there's, for me, being efficient, it's not always easy, but it can be in certain phases really important. So I literally took my week schedule, carved it up. And so here's what I said. I want family time. I want sports time. I want to do company A. I want to do company B. And I need a little bit of break. So I woke up every morning at 5 o'clock from 5 to 7. I worked on company B. Then I got on a train, which was one hour away, and I could that was flex time, which I could do either company A or B, because sometimes one company would need a little bit more. Then I get to company A, I work a full day's work, get on a train, and I've got another hour of flex time. I get home at seven o'clock, it's family time, and kind of let down time. So I'm there for dinner, I you know, spend time with you know, my son, help him on his homework, uh, on Wednesday nights, um, I had a trainer come to my house. I do some workout. Saturday morning, he comes to my house. Every weekend, from, I wake up at about 6. From 6 to the trainer time, I get about 3 hours. The rest of my family is sleeping. Uh, and then weekends were more or less my time. You know, I do a little bit, but I get basically 3 hours, 3 hours uh, on the weekend morning. So 6 hours for company B. Uh, 10 hours during the week. So 15 hours, 15, 16 hours for company B, 40 hours for company A, uh, and 10 hours of flex time for company A or B, and then I still have time for family in the evenings from 7 to 10.30, and, uh, you know, and then on the weekends it's family time. So literally carving it up and then getting into a habit and adjust. I always knew what I should roughly be doing, so there's no downtime, no wasted time, and so for a couple of years on this process, super efficient. Right? But that's what was required to do multiple studies. Thank you, that was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you so much for the talk. I did the same thing when I went to UCLA. Um, I did my master's in nine months, and I've never been done in less than like, it's a two to three year program, and just got super efficient, which I'm sure you guys you know, I to, to, to be at a school like this. Hi, uh, my name is Chris, I'm from Brazil, and I actually entered a show of California to open my startup. 
So it's great to hear from you. And you talked about when you're facing important decisions that you try to boil it down to the very few words that you think that represents what you're feeling. And that this process can take like some time, even like a month. But like how exactly, what framework like you go through to boil this down? Like, do you have like any specific methodology? It's hard. The words matter. I mean, and every word will matter. I'm going to say a hundred times a week. Right? Just what I'm doing. Um, a lot of times it starts with a feeling. So with that 2007 example, I was frustrated. And I wanted impact, and I wanted to be creative. All these ideas. That was a feeling. And I had a word floating around, startup. And I, not, I was in my 40s, and I had never, I knew nothing about startups. I'd never been to business school, never went to an entrepreneur seminar. I knew nothing about startups, but it was kind of like bouncing around. And then it wasn't, startup didn't capture it for me. Because ultimately the words that mattered were impact users, five projects. That was the core emotion that captured it for me. And then in 2007, so I could cap it, make a mission statement, and get serious and ambitious towards something. So I don't really have a way, but you really focus on the emotion. And when you're done, it should be measurable. Every word should be meaningful and not wasteful. Five projects in 2007 that impact users. Every word means something, and if you took one away, it doesn't, I've lost something. It doesn't capture it for me. So just work on it. And if you, I'll, I'll kind of uh, extend an offer, um, and I do this to other people. If you want to try this tool, um, send me an email. Like, think about it. Figure out your emotion. Try it out, and I'll critique your verbally stated goal. Right? You say, write me a, a whole paragraph. You say, blah, 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 I'm, I'm really unhappy with this part. I have this idea. Blah, 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 blah. Give me a little context and say, you know, so I boiled it down to this. And I'll say, well, that seems too abstract to me, the, the actionable. It doesn't feel like you're committing to anything. Or I might say, you know, I heard in your your, your context that this seems to be the core thing that I'm hearing it doesn't seem captured in the mission state. So I'd be happy to send me an email or whatever. I'm first name, my last name, dot com. I don't know how to com. I'm happy to, to give you feedback. But just try to capture that. Thank you. I'm going to ask a question for Jen. Yeah. This is something that's going to be used quite a bit. Uh, is it possible for AI machine learning to replace humans? Oh, um, I get asked that a lot. <laughs> um, I have a, my usual answer is I have a really great magic trick to answer that, but I'm not prepared for that. Um, so my view is AI is incredibly valuable and important, and it's revolutionizing pretty much every field where decision making matters. However, it's very vertical today. And we have no ability to do what humans, what everyone in this room and every two or three year old nephew or niece that you have can do, which is generalize. And what does generalize mean? It's to abstract the essence, the lesson from one situation and apply it in a very different but relevant situation. So we have no good techniques that can do that today. Um, the deep learning, machine learning, amazing what it can do, but it's more at a perceptual level. Kind of like what we're good at visually identifying things and making simple reactive movements like turn the wheel left or right. Um, but kind of planning, reasoning, and abstraction, uh, we don't have good methods. And until AI can really come up with a new breakthrough approach, because we don't even see the beginning of it. Um, I don't think we have anything to worry about. Is it perhaps possible? Absolutely. I think we are a computational machine. Is it going to happen in my lifetime? Uh, I would bet not. My question is, um, was money ever for passions, 
and was, uh, what got you to the point where it was not constrained? So, money was one of my verbally stated goals at one point. Um, most of my life I've been very lucky and blessed. I've always had enough money to do what I need to do, pretty much, you know, eat, go to school. Um, but when I got married, I had, all of a sudden, I had this new responsibility, and I wanted two things, and it was important to me as kind of a, you know, my wife uh, wasn't working, and I, was, I felt like a responsibility for someone else now. And I wanted to be able to have enough money to buy a house, or put a down payment for a house, what I thought I should do was you know, get something started and to have a child. And I couldn't afford either. So I was making, at the time, about $70,000. Uh, I, I was not in debt. I was very proud of that. I paid off my college. And so I had about 20000 in the bank. And I was renting in Palo Alto. And this was in 2000. And I'm like, every, like an old, Rundown house with a million dollars. I'm not going to get a million dollars. Today's numbers probably laugh at a small amount in bail. I'm like, I can't. I'm making 70000 a year at 20000 doesn't add up. And I needed medical help for the, to have a child. Um, it was going to cost me $75,000 when we get that. But it was important. It was like a real need. And so I made a verbally stated goal. I want to find a way to get enough money to have a down payment for a house and have a child. And I figured out how much exactly you know, money I needed after taxes in cash to do that. And one year later, boom, it arrived the exact amount after taxes in cash to do those goals. And my wife kind of said, well, you should have asked for more. <laughs> you should have asked for more. I'm like, that's not how it works. Right? It's not how it works. It has to be a core need, a core belief, something you really, you know, for the first time it was important to me. Um, and by committing to that, I made choices that I would not have made otherwise. I was at a job, which I loved, but it was not going to get me to that path. And so I, I stretched and I did things. So, so I don't know if that exactly answers your question. I've been lucky enough not to really be constrained to try things, because all I need is a computer to do most things I need. Right? And I could have I could have bought my first computer uh, when I was in high school with lawn lawn mowing money. Um, but a lot of money. <laughs> uh, but 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 finance is important at times in your life. And when you said that money just came to you, it was a job, right? Yeah, so, <laughs> no, of course. <laughs> I found this paper bag. I think we have time for two more questions. I mean, I don't know if you can ask one from the, the question. Okay. Well, actually, this is something that I was thinking about um, in, in terms of um, when we were talking about King Paul Warwick. And this is something I also hear a lot from students in terms of um, sort of the trade off between doing something that's going to you know, benefit you financially versus uh, sort of aligning to the passion. And this is something that you know, a lot of students say to me, oh, this is wonderful, I would love to be a part of it, but uh, everyone tells me to get a job or to pay off my student. Uh, how do you, um, is it possible for a student uh, these days to make a career sort of, you know, doing something like what you pursue with change on water or you know, something with, for a positive social impact? Um, I guess, so it's a tough question because my sister, for instance, she's a doctor. She's, you know, 40 something and still paying off, just very under one. And she makes plenty of money as a doctor, but that is, you know, and finance is a real issue uh, for her. So it's no joke. Um, you know, paying off loans will have long term benefit. Uh, on the other hand, I somehow subscribe to you have to follow your core path. You have to do what's true to you. And I believe if you, that I'm an optimist, but if you stay true to, who, to what you need, who you are, it will be okay. So that's my belief system. And, and so if, if, 
being going after a social cause is what you need to do. And I would say this to my son, do that. You know, do what you need. But know that because it's, you know, this is going to be important. You know, not paying off your finances is not good. Um, can you do both? I think you can, right? I think it's possible to to find really beneficial social causes and make money. Make a lot of money out of it and, and take care of both. Um, so you can often find a way. Um, so I don't have an answer, but be be true to who you are. And maybe it's a balance. I've had more than one goal sometimes at a time. And if, if you need to do both, commit to both. And figure, work it out. You have no way when you commit. Does not mean you have to know how you're going to do it. It's an acknowledgement that this is important to you, and you're going to you're going to find a way. To do it. Um, I if there's not a question. I have a question. Um, Adam, you're probably the closest that anybody um, we've ever had or have had interactions with Steve Jobs, and since he's never been a Newton speaker and never will be a Newton speaker. Unfortunately, I'm wondering if you might be able to share a story, if you have kind of an interesting story, that might leave us with something to think about. Um, so I can tell you lots of Steve Jobs stories. We are um, <laughs> So I've never seen a Steve Jobs movie or read a Steve Jobs book because I'm sure there's many aspects of the man that I don't want to know about or need to know about. I have my memories of him, and that's how I want to remember him. Um, so the first day I met him was when he said, hey, come over to my house tomorrow. And so we went to his house in Palo Alto, um, and the, you know, pretty austere, it's not super ostentatious, it's well done and beautiful, but nothing flashy. And right away, the first thing I realized about him is this guy has a fire in him to win. And I'm like, yeah, this is a billionaire. He's changed fields from music to computing to movies. Boy, but he could just like chill a little bit. Right? He's a billionaire. There was nothing chill about him. And he wanted to win. And he was doing this, he clearly wanted to buy the company. Um, and so he's being his most seductive, kind of charming guy. But right away, we started going at it. And he, yeah, we're talking about the future, and technology, and landscape. And he goes, um, do you think Apple should buy this company? I said, no, I don't think you should. What? No, no, then tell me why, no, that can't be. And I'm like, well, we'll be the business and this. I'm not going to name the company. It's, it's fun. But right then, we're like going out. And he really cared. It wasn't just a passing question. And he had his views. And the thing about him is he didn't want anyone to waste his time. He wasted his time. It was like the greatest sin. Knock you aside and... Don't waste my time. But if you had a perspective that you could back up, and you had reasoned argument, he was always open to hearing them. And there are a lot of people in life who have fixed views and believe they know it all. And the thing that I love about Steve Jobs the most is that he had strong views, but he never felt that he knew it all. And he was, because he wanted to win, to get it right, he was always trying to hear other people and then decide, does he agree? And so if you got, if you could stand up and back it up and you go, well, maybe, I'm going to think about it. That was, for me, an incredibly uh, amazing attribute. Uh, not everyone has it, but um, I believe that if you were still alive, I'd still be up. Right. I loved working with him. I wasn't always comfortable, um, but I could always go to him and tell him my truth, and he would listen. Um, he died, so Siri launched 
October 4th, 2011, seven years ago, and he died the very next day. So my Google Assistant is giving me all these reminders. Here are the photos he took seven years ago, and they're all of Apple with these beautiful photos of him, huge photos on the buildings. And I can tell you the whole Apple story, how they beautifully handled this time. Um, but, you know, he was, he was someone who would listen and think. I look back on Siri, we argued about all sorts of things on Siri. And he, I, there are things that I look back and say, you know, he was right. In, in retrospect, I didn't think Siri should have a voice. The original app didn't. I'm like, are you looking at a screen? Who wants to read something slow? He was right on that one. There are other things that I look back on. I go, you know, I was right. <laughs> so, but I was never, you know, I would present my idea. I fight for it. And he would say, I've heard you. I've thought about it. I don't think that's a problem. We're going to do it this way. And I was fine. He had the right to see you at the company, but I always felt heard. I felt that he thought about it. He told me, we're not going to do it, here's why. And so that, that's the one thing that I said I loved about Steve. He didn't feel he knew it all. He was desperate to, to get it right, and to get it right, and he would listen and think for the day. So it's um, at the beginning of the class when we started, we talked about the importance of having a growth mindset. And it's really, really rare to be able to see a growth mindset in action. I think you talked about that a little bit, Steve Jobs, but it's really, Adam, seeing it in you and seeing it in me uh, is incredibly inspirational. So thank you both for your time. And I think you might be able to stay another 10 minutes to talk with students one-on-one. -on -one. So a big hand. Thank you.